Doris is one of the most guarded places on Earth. It's known as Site R, or the Raven Rock Mountain Complex. You'll find it in Pennsylvania. The construction is 60 stories underground and is said to be a safe place for people in case of a natural or human-made disaster. There's not a lot of information online about this mysterious place, but what we do know is that it's equipped with 38 communication systems. It's obviously not available for visits via Google Earth, but you can catch a quick glance at the two gates that face the complex. Vatican City is one of the most famous enclaves on Earth, and it's certainly worth a visit due to its wonderful architecture and vast list of art pieces to check out. One place, however, will always be off limits for visitors, the Vatican's secret archives. They have some of the oldest and rarest books on Earth. These archives are available only to a limited number of people, and since they have been visited by a small number of people so far, they also trigger a lot of weird theories. For example, that there may be books proving there's life outside our planet. If you're fascinated by shipwrecks, you'll be interested to know that one of the largest wrecks you can see on Google Earth is on North Sentinel Island, India. It used to be called the SS Jassim. It was a Bolivian ferry that sank in the area back in 2003. The reason why people can't visit it physically isn't because of the ship itself, but because the island is home to the world's most dangerous tribe. We don't really know how many people live there, but it was estimated that between 50 to 400 people call this place home and they really don't like tourists. No person that tried to reach them survived. Also, to protect them, their privacy, and their special status, the island is closely monitored by the Indian authorities. That's mostly because it's believed the locals don't have any immunity to modern diseases. So being in contact with foreigners might be dangerous for the tribe's people, since they've never seen the outer world. A huge pink bunny appeared seemingly out of nowhere in the Italian Coletto Fava Mountains back in 2005. Besides the locals, some people stumbled upon it online too. They were puzzled by the discovery. Unfortunately, that 200-foot tall bunny is completely gone today. You can still find the images of it online though. The unusual object was designed by artists from Vienna. They encouraged tourists to climb, jump, or even take a nap on top of the large rabbit. The whole purpose of the project was to allow people to experience what it would be like to live as smaller creatures. The bunny didn't have any removal date at the time it was placed there and was expected to last at least until 2025. But Mother Nature had other plans. A Japanese artist decided to move back to her little home village named Nagoro. But she soon found out that most of her neighbors were moving to bigger cities. To deal with loneliness, she started putting together scarecrow-like dolls, or kakashi, in placing them all over her garden. She didn't stop there though. The artist soon began doing the same with many other places in her village, creating dolls and placing them as if they were taking part in various human activities. These dolls keep moving around too, but the woman likes to stay true to her story and insists she doesn't touch them. You can see the images of this quirky village on Google Maps. This weird portal was discovered via online maps in New Baltimore, New York. It gave people all sorts of bad dreams. With spooky looking buildings and all sorts of blurry figures, this area soon became a source for many weird internet theories. Turns out it was nothing more than a technical issue, which resulted in those images being rendered in a distorted manner. Either way, if you look for these images on Google, you won't be able to unsee them. This cute miniature world map was created by an artist from Denmark. He continuously worked on this tedious project from 1944 until 1967, using mostly his hands and just a few tools for moving heavy rocks around. He gathered stones at the edge of the water, then recreated the map of the world on the surface of this lake. During the winter, he was able to use a sled to transport larger pieces of rock over the ice and then place them in the perfect position. Apart from the continents themselves, the map also features rivers and lakes, as well as some other famous landmarks. Care to have a look at a sea without any coasts? Search for the Sargasso Sea. You'll find it in the northern Atlantic Ocean. This weird sea is surrounded by four ocean currents and no dry land at all. It got its name from the seaweed that grows there, Sargasso. Fingerprints on the lens of a satellite camera? You may be tricked into thinking this if you search for the finger maze. It's located in the city of Brighton, UK, and is a large fingerprint created in Hove Park. It also has a maze at the center. It can be really hard and time-consuming to look for wild animals on Google Earth, 
But the Geo Browser does have a nice feature that can help if you're eager to see hippos and flamingos in their natural habitat. Try Googling animals from above and start scrolling through these images. This unique feature can take you from Kenya to Namibia and even all the way to Antarctica, where you can see emperor penguins. There are some places on Google Maps that, for specific reasons, aren't available for the online public. Like the Royal Palace in Amsterdam. If you head over there via Google Earth, you'll see that everything around the Dutch Royal Palace is still visible, like the vegetation and roads. But the construction itself is blurred from all angles. That's probably because local authorities want to keep the unique views of the palace for the eyes of physical visitors only. The same goes for the Tantaco National Park in Chile. This one is a privately owned nature reserve that can only be seen on Google Maps from a distance. Once you reach a certain point, the zoom feature stops working. Some people say that since it's a nature preserve, it may be home to some endangered species, and extreme measures are taken for their protection. You know how a certain brand of fried chicken has a certain kernel on their logo? Yeah, you won't see any of these logos in high resolution on Google Maps. That's because the online map uses specific algorithms to detect people's faces and blur them out. As you can see, it's not always really that accurate. It's called Snake Island, and the Brazilian authorities prohibit people from visiting it. For good reason. You'll find the island near the city of Sao Paulo in Brazil. It's said to be home to over 4,000 snakes. Some of the most venomous types of reptiles on Earth call this place home. If that's not creepy enough, how about that some of them are so dangerous that a small drop of their venom can permanently damage the human skin? You can see the shape of the island on Google Earth. But the more you zoom in, the blurrier it becomes. Here's another cool thing you can do on Google Earth. Time travel. Well, at least sort of. You won't be able to travel back in time and tell yourself to study more for that tricky exam. But you can see certain historical images of places you like. You can check if this feature works by looking at the upper left corner of the screen. If you can see a small icon with a clock, it may allow you to scroll some years back. But you can also see how sunlight affects Earth if you turn on the sunlight feature. Welcome to No, a small town located in the south of Seward Peninsula on the west coast of Alaska. If you live here, I'll bet you say there's no place like Nome. Well, maybe not. It's cold and snowy here, and no roads connect this town with other settlements. And with the onset of night, locals have disappeared here without a trace. Perhaps that's why only 3,500 people live here. Well, let's investigate this case. People disappear in cities for assorted reasons. But it was Nome who attracted the attention of the public. From 1960 to 2004, some 24 people went missing there. That number is statistically too big for such a small population. People just didn't come home in the morning, and no one knew what had happened to them. All the locals in small towns like Nome know each other. There are almost no strangers here, as it's difficult to get to Nome. There are no roads and no ferry crossing. All roads from Nome break off and lead to beautiful natural landscapes unspoiled by human mammals. You can get there and back by plane. And this is not some passenger jet, but a small biplane. Another way to get there is by snowmobile. By the way, Nome is the ultimate point of the famous dog sled race, the Iditarod. Also, you can pay locals from neighboring villages and towns to bring you to Nome by motorboat. But despite this, the town has become quite famous. The frequent disappearance of people finally got needed attention. The whole world found out about Nome, and in 2009, Hollywood even made a movie about it. For a long time, no one could solve the mystery. The police had no clues, no witnesses, nothing. There are long, cold nights here in winter, and the air becomes so cold that a glass of water freezes in minutes. Snow can fall constantly. Therefore, if someone leaves the town at night, snow will sweep all traces away by the morning. Of course, people began to come up with their own theories. The most popular one was about someone who took people away by force. The police didn't find any evidence that some person could do it. So, if it's not a human, it could be some beast. And again, 
police found no evidence to support this version. After that, people started thinking that creatures from other planets caused these disappearances. Many locals were sure that the town was a popular destination for extraterrestrial spaceships. The plot of the Hollywood movie The Fourth Kind was based on this version. More time passed. Finally, the police and the FBI launched a large-scale investigation, and they uncovered the truth. They realized that the stories about missing people were exaggerated. The popularity of Gnome and the constant talk about fantastic things made people believe in the reality of these versions. Now, let's assume that some of the appearances were made up. But still, many people are gone. What about them? The answer is bars and harsh weather. Entertainment venues are open at night. Some locals have fun, leave the bar, and go home. At this moment, a heavy snowstorm begins. Visibility drops to zero, and the strong wind knocks you down. This way, a person might simply get lost. And that's it. The truth turned out stranger than most versions. The Bermuda Triangle is a big area in the Atlantic Ocean, so the disappearance of ships and planes there seems not so surprising. But it's much creepier when it happens on a lake. Let's visit the Lake Michigan Triangle. It's located between Michigan and Wisconsin. For a couple of centuries, terrible things have been happening here. People put the same legends around this place as around the Bermuda Triangle. They reported unexplained phenomena and saw flying objects above the lake surface. Some believe that the triangle is a time portal. Of course, no theories have been confirmed, but strange cases have occurred on the triangle territory. One happened in 1950, when a Northwest Airlines plane with 108 passengers disappeared without a trace during a flight over the lake. Police officers saw a red light over the lake two hours after the plane's last communication. The aircraft probably crashed, but rescuers didn't find any passengers or wreckage. All that's left was just an oil stain on the water. Many ships and boats disappeared there. But one of the strangest cases occurred on April 28, 1937. It was midnight. One ship was sailing through this lake. Captain George Donner went to sleep in his cabin after a hard day's work. Three hours later, the vessel was approaching the port. One of the crew members went to the captain's cabin to wake him up. The door was locked from the inside. The assistant knocked, but no one answered. When he suspected that something had happened to the captain, the assistant unlocked the door. He got into the cabin, but there was no captain there. He seemed to have disappeared into thin air. The crew couldn't find him. Since then, the eerie disappearance of Captain George Donner remains unexplained. Meet David Paulides. In 2008, he finished his career as a police officer and began to study the mysterious disappearance of people in Europe, the USA, and Canada. He found out that most people went missing in the U.S. national parks. Over the past 150 years, more than 1,100 tourists have vanished there. Many of them were experienced travelers who knew how to survive in harsh wild conditions. David has written about these mysterious vanishings. He pointed out that some of them didn't disappear, but were found alive. They woke up somewhere in the forest and didn't remember what had happened to them. The creepy detail of all these cases is that most missing persons were young. Another detail is that many went missing before hurricanes. There are too many riddles and not enough answers in this case. Then there's the Sargasso Sea in the northern part of the Atlantic Ocean. This is the only sea that doesn't have shores on land. It's called the sea only because it's defined by ocean currents. Also, golden brown algae grow in this area's bottom, making it seem like an orange spot in the middle of the endless ocean. The Sargasso Sea became famous because, in the 19th century, one of the most famous phantom ships in history sailed here. In 1872, a brigantine sailed through the Sargasso Sea. Its captain spotted another ship a few miles away. He lit a signal fire, but received no response. Then the captain decided to sail closer to find out what had happened. On the hull of the mysterious ship was the name Mary Celeste. The captain of the brigantine and several crew members went on board. They walked around the deck and looked into the cabins and the hold. 
everything was in place, but there were no people. The cargo and barrels remained untouched, so pirates didn't attack the vessel. The only damaged thing on the ship were the sails. They were torn to shreds. All documents except the logbook were missing from the navigator's cabin. The last logbook entry was added on November 24, 1872. The crew of the ship was never found, and this was one of many cases. In the 20th century, from the 60s to the 80s, there were many reports of empty boats and yachts floating on the sea. Also, some entire ships disappeared without a trace. All these cases still remain a mystery. According to one version, the four-sided current forms water funnels. Whirlpools can quickly pull a ship into the depths of the sea. This explains the disappearance of boats. But what about cases when the vessel is still on the water without a crew? Sometimes these whirlpools can create wind vortices. They're like little tornadoes. What if these whirlwinds are powerful enough to throw people overboard and tear the sails? Yeah, the theory seems too fantastic. So, what do you think happened? Imagine you decided to take a road trip the old-fashioned way. And by that, I mean you decide to do it without the help of any technology. What? So you go to the nearest convenience store and buy a map of each state you plan to pass through. You buckle them up on the passenger seat right next to you and set off on your adventure. During your first week, you arrive in the state of New York. You wave bye-bye to Lady Liberty, eat a slice of pizza, and head upstate. Near the Catskills, you notice you're running low on gas and decide to stop in the nearest town to fill up your tank. You check your map, and it appears that the nearest place is a small village called Aglo, right at the next intersection. You drive a few minutes and pass through a sign that says, Welcome to Aglo, home of the Aglo General Store. Well, this must be it, you think to yourself. But the town is strangely empty. You can't find the store or the gas station you were looking for. There are no houses. You start to think there might be a mistake. Aglo doesn't seem to exist. This story may sound made up, but it could have actually happened to anyone passing through New York a few years ago. Actually, the so-called town of Aglo is what is called a phantom settlement or a paper town. There are several of these around the world, but Aglo is probably the most famous. Paper towns are basically fake towns. That is, they don't really exist. They're made up of Easter eggs put there by map makers as a kind of copyright trap. Maps are tough to make. To create a map from scratch, one has to do years of field work or analysis of satellite photos. That's why plagiarism has always been rampant among map makers. It's pretty easy to redraw the same geographical features from one map onto a new map, and it is hard to get caught. People are, after all, drawing the exact same world. That's why map makers came up with a way to catch individuals stealing their data. Some map makers may include a mountain that is bigger than they are in reality. Others might add a slight turn on a road, where in reality there is none. For example, in the early 1970s, a fake mountain peak appeared on some Boulder County maps. The addition of this previously unknown peak, called Mount Richard, into local maps began to confuse Colorado rock climbers at the time. It turned out that Mount Richard was one of these copyright traps, put there by a local maps man called Richard Siachi. Let's just say he must have decided to pay a tribute to himself with this little addition. Now, adding a paper town is perhaps one of the most extreme solutions, one that map makers hope goes unnoticed. But that's not what usually happens, which leads us back to the Aglo story. Map makers Ernest Alperts and Otto Lindbergh from the CDG, General Drafting Corporation, were part of the largest map publishers of the 1930s. Back then, the company was commissioned to create a map of the state of New York. That's when the two men had an idea. In order to prevent copyright infringement, they would create a phantom settlement combining parts of their names together. They came up with the strange name Aglo and added the fake town along Route 206 near the water reservoir of Catskills in upstate New York. The area was supposed to be, in reality, a dirt road. Years later, Rand McNally, another map designing company, produced a map of New York that included a town called Aglo in the same location where CDG had originally placed it. 
Lindbergh was convinced that he had a copyright case against his competitor. But the story just kept getting more complicated. Both companies went to settle the case in court. But as it turned out, McNally had a legitimate reason for adding Aglo to their version of a New York map. You see, in order to fabricate their maps, McNally did a thorough research on real estate and establishments located in each existing town. And as it turned out, Aglo was not an empty town when they drew their map. Records show that the town housed an establishment named Aglo General Store. Sure, it was the only building in town, but that was enough for the map makers to believe that such a town really existed. They added Aglo to the map like they would add any other town with physical establishments. It seemed they weren't infringing any copyright if this once phantom settlement had somehow come to life. The plot twist is that CDG's Alpers and Lindbergh could never have foreseen that someone would decide to occupy a made-up town. But it happened. One day, someone bought a map from a regional gas station that had Aglo marked on it. The person wanted to open a store more or less where Aglo existed, so they decided to name the store after the town it was in. They trusted the accuracy of the map they bought and named their business Aglo General Store. After all, why would there be a non-existent town on an official map? The general store didn't last many years, only enough to turn this story into a mess. On the bright side, (laughs) this whole debacle turned Aglo into a super-famous fictitious settlement. It became a tourist spot, with people driving from all over the US to get a picture of the town's welcome sign. Now, as we said before, paper towns are plenty around the world and over time, too. A 2005 BBC documentary revealed that the city of London alone had over 100 tiny fake streets or paper streets around the city. For instance, the so-called Moat Lane is supposedly a curving road in Finchley, North London. But if you ever decide to go visit, you'll find nothing but trees and gardens. And what about Argleton, a town in the north of England? Or more accurately, an empty field in northeastern England? Argleton existed for a while on Google Maps. There were hotel listings and apartments for rent in town. Well, the only thing is that they weren't really in Argleton, but rather in nearby settlements. It's believed that Google Maps imported these fake streets into its database as they used renowned copyrighted atlases as their sources. But as the truth about these paper streets surfaced, the company later deleted them. If we turn back the clock a few hundred years, we'll find another mystery story involving a possible phantom settlement. But this isn't a tiny town at an intersection, but rather an entire island. Bermejo Island was speculated to be a tiny inhabited island. It appeared on many maps of the 16th and 17th centuries and was a hot spot for Spanish explorers. Its location sometimes varied slightly from map to map, and occasionally its name appeared as Vermija, but its existence seemed certain enough. It wasn't until the 18th century that the island stopped being depicted in maps altogether. This island's last appearance dates back to a 1921 edition of a Mexican atlas, and then poof. It dropped out of the horizon altogether. The case of Mexico's disappeared island has raised many questions. Did it sink? Was it destroyed? Are people simply looking for it in the wrong place? Three official investigations took place in 2009 to locate the island. They used high-end technologies, scouring Mexico's oceans and seabeds. Yet, Bermija remained nowhere to be found. One can't help but wonder if the island ever existed at all. Similar to modern-day mapmakers, 16th and 17th century mapmakers had their way to trick map users. Instead of copyright traps, these fake towns or even fake islands served as a way to fool and confuse enemies and unwanted voyagers. Since a long time has gone by, it's hard to know whether Bermija was just another phantom settlement. It stopped being depicted on maps, but this mysterious case still leaves people baffled and confused. They used to call this island the Paris of the East, mostly because it had beautiful buildings with large gardens and impressive stone archways. But now, it's nothing like it used to be, with all the architecture almost entirely covered in tree roots and vines. Ross Island is a small territory in the Indian Ocean, It's located east of the Indian city of Port Blair. 
Though initially thought of as a jail, Ross Island eventually became a luxurious resort for the local administrators. They called this island a real treat for its more privileged residents. It boasted opulent bungalows, stained glass window panels brought all the way from Italy, neatly kept gardens, tennis courts, and even swimming pools. Soon after the complex was closed in 1937, a powerful earthquake hit the island. It caused a lot of damage, making it even more uninhabitable. The island is now in the administration of India and has become a tourist attraction for people interested in abandoned towns. Pieces of German architecture still lie hidden in the Namibian desert. The city of Kolmanskop, Namibia, was a luxury location at its peak in the early 1900s when German workers settled here looking for diamonds. This abandoned town used to have everything from a ballroom to a hospital and even a bowling alley. It all started to decline somewhere in the late 1910s when another diamond-packed location was found nearby. So, most of the people living here moved, leaving everything behind in search of more money. Kolmanskop has since been slowly occupied by sand dunes, while the hot temperature and low moisture help to preserve the buildings. This ghost town is also available for visitors. If it sounds interesting, you can book a tour in the nearby town of Luderitz. Another abandoned castle dominates the view in Krakow, a city in Italy. The whole village sits atop a cliff that's 1,312 feet high. The founders liked this location since they knew it would be easy to defend themselves from unwanted guests. But the castle, built in the 1300s, soon became overwhelmed by landslides and earthquakes. Even though it has no residents anymore, the medieval city often comes alive during the various local festivals that take place here in the summer months. The locals also offer tours and tell amazing stories about the location. One of the highlights of the tour is a statue that seemingly came out of nowhere and now lies in a body of water. Hidden away in the Montana mountains, Garnet Ghost Town tells the well-known American story of the West's Gold Rush. The town's history goes back to the 1890s when they found a lot of gold in the Nancy Hanks mine. During its glory days, Garnet had almost 1,000 residents. Even though it's in a relatively secluded location, it had saloons, hotels, stores, a school, and other features of a regular little town. In 1905, when most of the gold had already been taken away, most mines were left behind, so only a couple of hundred residents stayed in Garnet. The final straw came in 1912, when a fire damaged most of the town's buildings. So, by the 1940s, Garnet was completely abandoned. It soon became a hotspot for treasure hunters looking for furnishings and artifacts. That was until a preservation campaign started in the 1970s. It ended with the town being declared a historic district in 2010. To this day, Garnet is one of the best preserved ghost towns in the area. Hashima Island is another abandoned location that tells us that when people leave, nature takes over. This mysterious place was even featured in a James Bond movie because of its ghostly landscape. It used to be a well-known spot in Japan for undersea coal mines as it was opened in 1881. In 1959, at its peak, there were over 5,000 people living here, including mine workers and their families. As soon as the mines started going dry, sometime in 1970, people started to slowly depart the island leaving it completely abandoned in three months. Even though nobody lives there these days, there are a lot of tourists here that drop off to wander around the abandoned homes, swimming pools, stores, and factories. Another town that started with a mining company back in 1881 is Calico, California. People discovered the location was packed with silver, so it soon became home to over 500 silver mines and 3,000 residents. It used to feature hotels, general stores, restaurants, and a school. There was even a local newspaper printed here called the Calico Print. But by 1986, the town had become empty. One of the former locals decided to buy it and began its restoration, making it a registered historical landmark. It even has a museum of the Old West available for tourists. 
one of the most interesting attractions that were rebuilt is the one mile long Calico and Odessa Railroad. It currently goes through the steep canyons and hills and even passes the old mines and buildings north of Calico. Approximately one third of the town is original, while the rest consists of newer buildings that are replicas meant to recreate the spirit of its past. If you're a fan of cars, you might have heard of Henry Ford as the famous American industrialist who founded the Ford Motor Company in 1903. But in 1927, he began working on another one of his ambitious dreams, Fordlandia. It was supposed to be a massive rubber plantation located near the Tapajos River in Brazil, since he needed a reliable source of rubber for his car tires and hoses. His vision was to design a town complete with swimming pools, a golf course, living bungalows, and even weekly square dancing sessions for the locals. This project was unfortunate to begin with, since the local rubber trees soon got infected with leaf fungus. Even though Henry Ford invested a staggering $20 million into this potential income source, the town failed to produce the needed rubber. He had nothing left to do but to sell it to Brazil in 1945. And soon, it was completely abandoned. Many of its buildings are still standing, but have been taken over by the surrounding nature. You can still see curious tourists wandering through it to this day. During its glory days, Hampi was the second largest city in the world. Looking at its ruins today, it's hard to imagine this Indian city used to be filled with temples and bazaars and that it served as an important center of the Mauryan Empire in the 14th and 15th centuries. It was destroyed in the 16th century, but it still has beautifully preserved forts and markets. It became part of the UNESCO World Heritage in 1986, aiming to protect its buildings, such as the Lotus Mahal, a stone structure that was carved to resemble a lotus flower opening to the sun. A tourist village was constructed back in 1920 along the shore of Epicuan, a salt lake about 370 miles southwest of Buenos Aires in Argentina. It was designed to provide people with a busy city life a breath of fresh air near the restorative salt waters of the nearby lake. It was soon equipped with a railroad station and ended up having a population of more than 5,000 residents. The project was also destined to fail soon enough as the unusual amount of rain at that time caused Lake Epicuan to swell. In 1985, the water took over the local dam and the town was flooded. The waters were so deep that they even reached a depth of 33 feet in 1993. They only began to recede in 2009 and left behind the remaining buildings, literally encrusted in salt. No one came back to the town except for Pablo Novak, who returned here back in 2012 and was the only resident of Villa Epicuan at the time. It was April 10, 1912. Richard had just departed from Southampton, England, aboard the most famous ship of the time, dubbed the Unsinkable. Since he had just witnessed a near collision with the SS City of New York, he decided to write to his wife and report the unfortunate and frightening event. My dearest Sal, he wrote, we got away yesterday after a lot of trouble. Little did he know that a mere four days later, both his pen and the ship he was on would be lost forever at the bottom of the North Atlantic Ocean. Was this some sort of bad omen? Did Richard actually foresee what was about to happen to the ship he was on? In case you haven't figured it out by now, Mr. Richard Geddes was aboard the Titanic on the day that he wrote the letter to his wife. On April 14, 1912, the ship seemed to have been lost forever. Along with it, so many secrets and treasures have settled at the bottom of the ocean. It took until 1985 for the Titanic's wreck to be finally rediscovered using state-of-the-art sonar technology. Ever since then, they've managed to recover thousands of items from the Titanic, and many of them went on display or auction. Things like jewelry, a life jacket, a menu from the ship's restaurant, or even a sample square of carpet from the first-class stateroom have all captivated the public's attention, just like the many stories of the people on board. Scientists have even tried to come up with strategies to get the Titanic back up altogether to properly study it and stop it from getting more and more damaged at the bottom of the ocean. Some have suggested filling the wreck with ping pong balls to make it float, while others even considered injecting it with 180,000 tons of Vaseline. Another idea 
was to use 450,000 tons of liquid nitrogen to trap it in an iceberg that would float to the surface. But they eventually had to let go of all these potential strategies, since the Titanic is way too fragile to ever be recovered. The Titanic may be one of the most interesting ships lying at the bottom of the ocean, at least in popular culture, but deep sea divers have a lot of other stories to share. Planes also sometimes find their way to the bottom of the ocean. Deep sea divers in Oahu, Hawaii came across the wreckage of an F4U Corsair plane. It seems to have crashed into the ocean in 1946, as it didn't have sufficient fuel. If you can dive deep enough, you might even stumble upon statues and lost artifacts, like those found in the world's only underwater archaeological park off the coast of Naples, Italy. It features the ruins of the ancient Roman city of Baia. The underwater statues found here are breathtaking, to say the least. In an ironic twist of events, some of the equipment we intended to use to get us to the moon was lost at the bottom of the sea for a very long time. But how did that happen? Beginning from the late 1960s and ending in the early 70s, many Apollo rockets were launched to orbit the Earth and the moon. When reaching altitudes of about 38 miles, the first portion of the spacecraft, including the engines, needed to separate. People thought these components got destroyed or lost forever. But were they really? In 2012, a team of specialists discovered a bunch of rocket engines 14,000 feet off the coast of Florida. They have since gone through a two-year renovation plan and are now on display at Seattle's Museum of Flight. Can you imagine stumbling upon a whole city underwater? Back in 2001, a lost city was discovered in the Gulf of Cambay, off the coast of India. Some archaeologists believe it to be the oldest city in history. By comparison, it's almost the size of Manhattan and features massive walls and even plazas. They stumbled upon pieces of sculpture, artwork, and even what looked like ancient wooden furniture, believed to date back up to 9,500 years ago and 5,000 years older than any city previously discovered. Okay, how about an underwater river? I can't even imagine what that would look like, but some deep divers claim to have seen it south of Tula, Mexico. Is that even possible? Well, not really, since the Cenote Angelita Cave is not a true river, but a very special type of optical illusion. It's formed by a halocline, meaning a cloud of hydrogen sulfide at the bottom of this underwater cave. Turns out you can actually swim right through this cloud, which makes you feel like you're swimming through a flowing body of water. Not all things discovered underwater are inanimate objects. Some of them are actually quite scary sea creatures. A jellyfish might not be on your list of things to look out for if you can avoid the stings. But this giant one, also known as a lion's mane jellyfish, is the largest known species of its kind. In all fairness, you'll only uncover it if you happen to dive into the waters of the Arctic, Northern Atlantic, and Northern Pacific Oceans. You surely won't miss it, since it stretches across 120 feet from the top to the bottom of its tentacles. When it comes to deep sea diving, a lot of people are looking to discover some lost treasure. One diver was lucky enough to have hit the literal jackpot when he came upon nearly $1 million worth of treasure on the bottom of the seabed. That was back in 2015, when this lucky diver was swimming just off the coast of Florida. What did he find, you might ask? Well, about 51 gold coins, 40 feet of gold chain, and a rare single coin that was tailored for the King of Spain, Philip V. Speaking of people looking for lost treasures, divers also sometimes found pirate ships. They discovered one of these pirate shipwrecks in 2015 off the coast of Colombia. It dates back to the 18th century. The value of this forgotten ship was estimated to be between $4 billion and $17 billion, as it contained treasures, precious stones, gold, and countless other really valuable items. By comparison, a whole island in the Bahamas is up for grabs at $75 million. A computer is the last thing you'd ever expect to discover underwater, right? And this was no regular computer, but an ancient one. And yet, Someone stumbled upon it between 1900 and 1901 on the spot of a shipwreck located off one Greek island. 
Researchers believe this weird stone contraption to be the earliest form of a computer. It was designed to serve many purposes, such as predicting astronomical positions and eclipses on the calendar. Since humanity lost most of the technology used back then, it was wonderful to rediscover it so many years later. It let us piece together many of the ancient Greeks' accomplishments. The computer is now at the National Archaeological Museum of Athens, should you ever want to check it out in person. This has to be one of the most mysterious places on Earth. It's called the Mariana Trench, and it's the deepest part of the Earth's oceans. We really don't know how deep it is, since it's so difficult to measure. But it's somewhere around 7 miles deep, and 5 times longer than the Grand Canyon. They first studied this massive underwater hole back in 1875 using a weighted rope. Back in 2012, a Canadian film director named James Cameron reached the bottom of the trench in the submersible vessel Deep Sea Challenger. Some of the most bizarre creatures on the planet call this place their home, including the Dumbo octopus, the sea cucumber, and the goblin shark. The Mariana Trench took its name after the nearby Mariana Islands, which are named Las Marianas in honor of the Spanish queen Mariana of Austria. Have you ever wondered how cool buildings of the future are going to look? Well, hold on tight because artificial intelligence is here to revolutionize the world of architecture. AI is a great sidekick. It can give the architects incredible new tools to create mind-blowing structures that are not only stunning, but also eco-friendly and super efficient. So let's check what our beautiful future might look like. First of all, you know how cities can get crazy busy and overwhelming, right? Well, guess what? AI is here to save the day and make our cities super smart. Imagine you're cruising down the road in your flying car. Yes, we'll have those. Thanks to AI, the traffic flows like a dream. No more endless gridlock. The city knows where the most likely crime spots are and takes proactive steps to keep us safe. It's like having superheroes on every corner. And hey, forget about trash piling up. AI makes sure waste is managed efficiently, keeping our city clean and fresh. They can act as a city manager who can optimize everything from traffic to safety and even waste disposal. They can analyze tons of data from all sorts of places like sensors and social media. With all that information, they can help city planners make brilliant decisions that make our lives better. Okay, so you stroll down the street and your eyes are instantly captivated by an extraordinary building. Its futuristic curves and features make it stand out from the rest. And it not only catches your eye, but also gives Mother Nature a high five. You might think it was designed by a genius architect, but little do you know it was actually a collaboration between humans and artificial intelligence. Imagine having a super smart design buddy who can whip up thousands of incredible building ideas in a blink of an eye. That's what AI-assisted design software does for architects. It can generate and assess a ton of design options. They take into account stuff like the best materials to use and the perfect placement for the building. Also, by analyzing data and crunching numbers, algorithms can help optimize the building's design. They can ensure it minimizes energy usage, conserves water, and manages waste like a pro. Every building strives to reduce costs, save energy, and promote a better world. The result? Architectural masterpieces that are both jaw-droppingly beautiful and super practical. The cityscape of the future will be dotted with these awe-inspiring structures. Oh, but that wasn't impressive enough for you? Well, how about a stunning, futuristic building that seems to defy gravity? It's not made of traditional bricks and mortar, oh no! This marvel was created using the powers of 3D printing. With the help of AI, architects designed every intricate detail and fed all the important data, like what materials to use and how the site conditions might affect the structure. AI algorithms worked their magic to optimize the design, making it both breathtakingly beautiful and rock solid. 3D printing is basically like having a magical machine that can create awesome structures straight out of a sci-fi movie, and AI jumps in to make sure these structures are not just pretty, but also strong. In the city of the future, 3D printing will become the ultimate architect's tool. It will allow them to create structures that were once impossible to build. From mind-bending shapes to intricate details, the possibilities are endless. But AI isn't just making buildings look great, it also makes them efficient and cozy. Let's say you step into a futuristic office building, and voila! 
The lights automatically adjust to match your mood, and the temperature is set perfectly for you. These futuristic buildings are capable of sensing and responding to their surroundings just like you do. They control the lighting, keeping it just right for the time of day. They manage the temperature, so it's always cozy and comfortable. They even keep a watchful eye on security and fix small issues before they become big headaches. So, the smart building knows when people come and go, so it optimizes energy usage accordingly, saving the planet and some cash along the way. Now the cool thing is, all these aren't the only possibilities. How about turning skyscrapers into a vertical forest? Recently, an architect from India got super excited about the power of artificial intelligence. So, he decided to team up with an image bot called Midjourney to create a vision for the future. But instead of a dull, robotic world, they aimed for something spectacular. With text prompts like utopian technology and futuristic towers, the architect and AI got to work. Guess what? Midjourney didn't disappoint. It conjured up a world where buildings were covered in lush vertical forests and adorned with shapes inspired by nature. They wanted to create a sustainable future that harmonized with the environment. The architect, Manas Bhatia, is super positive about AI's potential. He doesn't see it as a threat to his job, but as a powerful tool for positive change. He envisions a future where architects and AI collaborate to make breathtaking designs. In his project, Patya even asked the AI to imagine symbiotic and hollowed structures, and it responded with pictures of apartments nestled within hollowed-out trees. Imagine a world where the building itself becomes a living, breathing part of nature. Well, Bhatia believes that nature should play a big role in architecture. He loves designing structures that embrace nature's beauty and functionality. From buildings built around trees to facades that regulate temperature, he's all about blending architecture with the natural world. With architects like Patia and the superpowers of AI, the future of cities is going to be amazing. So get ready to step into a world where nature and technology coexist in perfect harmony. It's a dream we can't wait to see come true. Or if you're not a big fan of trees, how about this? Skyscrapers that aren't made of solid bricks, but instead, they're inflatable wonders. Zumo, an architectural practice in Barcelona, used the magic of AI to bring these wobbly structures to life. These inflatable superstructures rise above future cities like illuminated balloons in the sky. Here's the best part. These inflatable buildings have sustainability superpowers. You can pump them up to towering heights, flatten them for easy transportation, and rebuild them wherever they're needed. Plus, they're powered by renewable energy, reducing their impact on the environment. Pretty cool, right? Phew, the future is zooming toward us like a rocket. Artificial intelligence can become the secret sauce that makes architects work extra special. But hey, with great power comes great responsibility. We need to use AI wisely and ethically. For now, we don't have to worry about machines replacing architects. Artificial intelligence still needs a human hand, or else we might end up with buildings that look like mashed up bananas or ice cream cones, unless that's your thing. In addition, humans have one important advantage. They, well, are humans. We need to keep in mind that artificial intelligence doesn't have emotional intelligence. It's a brainy genius, but it can't fully understand the feelings and vibes we humans crave in our spaces. So, we must remember to infuse our designs with that human touch, those warm and fuzzy elements that make us go, ah, I feel right at home. And let's not forget that AI is still learning. It's basically just taking its first steps, and we need to be patient and give it time to grow. Rushing things too quickly could lead to wonky designs or buildings that look like a jumbled puzzle. This might look cool if you like avant-garde architecture, but for regular folk, no thanks. So, as the future unfolds at warp speed, let's embrace the wonders of AI and architecture. But let's also remember to balance its brilliance with our own human touch. Together, we can create a future where buildings are not just functional, but also filled with heart and soul. It's an adventure that's out of this world. Well, looky here. It's New York City, the Big Apple, the city that never sleeps, Hong Kong on the Hudson, the greatest city in the world, New York, New York, the city so nice they named it twice. All right, I'll stop. You thought you knew this city so well, but underneath all that glitz and glamour is a facade, literally. New York is populated with some of the most iconic urban buildings in the world and home to some of the most unique and famous towers. Who would have known that New York was a front for fake buildings? 
And the cool thing is that there are plenty to search for. Okay, I'm adding that to my bucket list. So, the question is, why do they put these fake buildings all over New York? The city is one of the most vibrant places in the world and requires many infrastructures to keep the city in motion. That means having many industrial structures and buildings in every major district. New York is charming for the design and the buildings. Imagine having industrial structures right next to your favorite pizza parlor or hot dog stand. The designers thought ahead and decided to disguise those industrial infrastructures as fake buildings. They blend with the city so well that they don't stand out. They look like your good old apartment or housing unit with a front door, real-life windows, and even charming balconies where people would hang out. The only thing is that there's nothing behind the facade and no one is allowed inside. So where in the world can you find these fake buildings? For starters, one of the most popular fake buildings is in Brooklyn. At 58 Giralamont Street, you can find a very typical neighborhood. But between the buildings stands a brick building with a slightly deeper shade than the rest. It has bright open windows that blend in with the rest of the buildings in the neighborhood, except that they're blacked out. At first glance, you might not think of it as anything. But if you pay close attention, the building looks like a glitch from a video game. It was built in 1847, way before New York was considered glamorous. Originally, it was meant to be a regular building, but in 1908, they converted it into a fake building. Don't think you can just try to break in. Even if you could, it's pointless, because it's part of a ventilation fan for the subway. It also serves as an emergency exit for some of the surrounding buildings. Actually, throughout New York, many fake buildings exist to disguise the subway vents for the smoke to escape. All the way to 415 Bruckner Boulevard, the Bronx, this townhouse was designed by the Switzer Group, which is an interior architect company. It's not as charming as the one at 58 Jorah Lemon Street, but it serves a similar purpose – to hide an electric substation for New York's utility company. The city needs these substations to reduce the high-voltage electricity to a lower voltage so it can be distributed locally. Having a building like this popping out of the middle of your neighborhood isn't exactly the smartest way to attract people to the Bronx. That's why the fake townhouse facade is the perfect camouflage. Now, some of these fake buildings don't really hit the mark and stick out like a sore thumb. The people of Manhattan describe the Mulry Square infrastructure as a complete clunker. After plenty of redesigns and back to the drawing board meetings, the result is still not pretty. The locals compare it to a concrete box. They created windows without glass, which doesn't allow the building to blend in with the rest of the neighborhood. But it beats a typical subway ventilation plant either way. There are just so many places to visit and cross off your bucket list. But if you live in China, you can literally stay in the country and visit many iconic cities around the world. The replica cities began when the Chinese economy started booming in the early 90s. They wanted the lifestyle of the rich and famous without wanting to leave their country. They can be comfortable eating their local food and get the feeling of being abroad. The Chinese province of Guangdong has an identical copy of the historical Australian alpine village Hallstatt. The real Hallstatt is centuries old and one of the most charming places to discover. The local people of Hallstatt also had no idea that their home was being built in China. Some people thought that this was controversial, probably because it cost around $940 million to build it. Paris is undoubtedly one of the most charming cities you could ever visit. Its rich history and vibrant culture are enough to catch the first plane to go there. For residents of Tian du Cheng, that's something they can do anytime they want. The city is also known as Sky City and has a replica of the Eiffel Tower that looks eerily like the iconic one in Paris and built buildings to match the city's visual charm. One of the main things that will break the charm is the farmland surrounding the city. There's barely anyone there, and the streets are always empty, very un-Paris-like. Still, you can find some nice fountains and statues scattered along the streets to give it some spirit. There's laundry hung everywhere, even on the trees. The picturesque fountains are dry and many apartments are empty. Only a few stores are open for business. Even though this looks like a fake city, it's quite real. Some people live here because it's more affordable than other places. 
two hours away from this town is another version of Paris's Pont Alexandre III and a carbon copy of London's Tower Bridge, but with four towers instead of two. Hey, such a bargain! You can also visit the closest thing to Italy, but this time you can go shopping. Florentia Village is an outlet mall that offers an array of shops to lose yourself. The good thing is that this was built by an Italian developer to capture the essence of an Italian village. It has fountains, canals, and mosaics for proper aesthetics. It began in 2011 and has more than 200 shops with many Italian brands and British, US, and Chinese brands as well. The place is so popular that it gets between 10,000 and 25,000 visitors per day. China also has other replica towns that put you in a mini Manhattan called the Yuzhipu Financial District. The developer's goal was to make this place the financial center of the world. It was complete with the right landmarks, like the Rockefeller and Lincoln Centers, but the project was halted in 2019, leaving it mainly empty. You can find a typical English town with cobbled streets, Victorian homes, and restaurants that make Thames Town. This place was meant to recreate a European lifestyle fantasy without leaving Shanghai. China also has a Dutch town that has some elements of Amsterdam with windmills and famous canals. They even decided to copy some of the landmarks, like the Netherlands Maritime Museum. Here's a bonus story of Lebanon's thinnest building built out of a dispute. It's the story of two brothers who both inherited unequal plots of land. One of the brothers happened to get a very thin plot of land and couldn't help but be jealous of his brother's nice plot of land. He wasn't pleased. Both of the lands overlooked the Mediterranean Sea in a lively neighborhood of Beirut. So it's no wonder that both brothers couldn't agree on how they should develop their lands. It was obvious that the brother with the most land could build a proper building. The other brother had to improvise. He decided to obstruct his brother's property by constructing a thin building enough to only fit 14 feet at its widest and 2 feet at its most narrow. It was constructed in 1954, and the locals of the area know it as the Grudge. The crazy thing is that the place was once habitable with many visitors enjoying their stay. It's not easy to live there, but it's part of living the experience. The building is still standing, but is empty. Wow, every morning, 8.5 million people wake up in New York City. But the Big Apple doesn't belong only to humans. This is the city of ants. There are 17 billion of them here. They live in houses, hide in the grass, crawl under asphalt, and climb trees. For every New Yorker, there's a sneaker box filled with ants. City ants are more fortunate than their forest cousins. They don't have any need to look for food. Millions of people leave behind tons of hot dog crumbs, pizza slices, and coffee drips. Insects just have to wait for a lunch break in an office building. Then they gather around benches in the park or cafe tables. A lot of food is waiting for them there. Over 1 billion! That's how many ants are running through the streets and parks of Manhattan. And in this ocean of insects, scientists have been able to spot tiny reddish-brown creatures. These insects don't fit into any of the 13,000 ant species known to science. They're unique and only live in Manhattan. Their kingdom is between 63rd and 76th streets. Scientists don't know how long the Manhattans <laughs> have evolved in isolation. They arrived in the US on ships from Europe and were cut off from the rest of the city's infrastructure. But why go anywhere else if there's enough food? The Manhattan loves fast food, especially corn syrup. Because of such a diet, the insect's body has an increased carbon content. This isn't a problem for the ant, though. Carbon helps it adapt to the dry, warm weather of the concrete jungle. Around 20% of New York City is parks and green spaces. White-footed mice live in these places. Scientists have found out that the mice that live in New York have evolved. They're different from their village relatives. These changes are genetical. It's caused by the diet of white-footed rodents that feed on human food waste. For example, New York mice need enlarged livers to process fatty acids from fast food. Central Park in New York is almost twice the size of the Principality of Monaco. A unique centipede is only found in this green area. The creature, called Hoffman's Dwarf Centipede, 
doesn't grow any longer than 0.4 inches. It lives in heaps of dry plants and runs on 41 pairs of legs. This crustacean, measuring only a bit more than 0.3 inches, is called the Socorro isopod. It's one of the rarest animals on the planet. The creature can only be found in a small thermal spring near Socorro, New Mexico. The isopod lives in the water as warm as 90 degrees Fahrenheit and covered with a layer of algae. These are ideal conditions for the creature. To get to Mobile Cave, you'd have to repel 65 feet down. That's the height of a four-story building. After that, you'd crawl through narrow passages and swim along a canal with cold water. Sunlight can't get into the cave. The air is poisoned by vapors of ammonia and hydrogen sulfide. This extreme place has been isolated from the outside world for 5.5 million years. A unique ecosystem has formed in this toxic atmosphere. Of all the animals that live there, 33 species of millipedes, scorpions, spiders, and leeches can't be found anywhere else on Earth. These creatures are mostly blind and colorless. Well, why would you need eyes in disguise if you live in complete darkness? Mobile's coolest guy is the venomous centipede. Scientists have nicknamed this animal the king of the cave. It doesn't grow more than 2 inches, but for this world, it's a giant. The blind salamander would feel great in the company of strange animals from Mobile. But these little monsters are separated by the ocean and thousands of miles. The Mobile Cave is located in Romania, where these beauties live only in Texas. Their home is an underground body of water in the San Marcos area. These salamanders grow to be 5 inches long. The name makes it pretty clear that the animal is blind. It does have eyes, but they're pretty much useless. This doesn't stop the salamander from being a skilled snail and shrimp hunter. It senses other animals by feeling the underwater waves they create while moving. The Scottish wildcat lives in the north of Scotland. This animal is different from domestic cats, which love sleeping on the couch. Unlike them, it's a perfect hunter. The creature is 25% larger than the average cat. It's muscular and long-legged. The wild cat's tail is blunt and fluffy, covered in black rings with a black tip on the end. The quokka is called the world's happiest animal. Just look at its smile. This fluffy animal seems to always be ready for a photo shoot. Quokkas are only found in Australia. Around 10,000 animals live on Rottnest Island and several other locations. The creature's cute smile is an evolutionary trait. An open mouth helps it breathe and regulates its body temperature. Oh, by the way, if you try to feed a quokka, you'll have to pay a fine of more than 200 bucks. This baby will feel comfortable even if you put it on your little finger. The animal lives only on the island of Madagascar. Scientists have found just two tiny reptiles, a male and a female. The researchers have named the nano-chameleon Brochesia nana. It's a mystery to them why it doesn't grow larger than a sunflower seed. The next animal on the list also lives only in Madagascar. Locals call this creature ai ai. The unusual lemur spends most of its life in trees and leads a nocturnal lifestyle. This might explain why it looks so tired. Even though the ai is a lemur, its teeth are like those of a rodent. Its claws resemble sloth's claws, and its body looks like that of a monkey. The animal's fingers and toes are especially frightening. They're long and thin, with pointy claws. <laughs> Get equipped for any season with brand new Brightside merch. Click the link and grab your print. This is a giraffe with its trademark long neck. A zebra is grazing nearby. Black and white stripes on its body help the animal reflect sunlight during the day and keep it warm at night. But what if you combine these animals? No need, nature has done this work for you. The okapi looks like a giraffe with a short neck, horse body, and zebra stripes on its legs. The okapi has a long tongue. Males have small giraffe horns on their heads. You can only meet these unusual animals in the African rainforest. If you decide to travel around Africa afterward, you must visit the Ethiopian highlands. That's where you see unique gelada monkeys. 
And no, they're not named after the Italian ice cream. That's gelato. Don't mix that up. Males look like rock stars from the 70s. They're bright and have cool hair. But don't mess with these animals. They aren't too friendly. Gelatas spend most of their time on the ground. And the main part of their diet is the grass they collect during the day. Scientists believe that gelatas are the remaining members of an ancient gang of critters. It lived millions of years ago in vast spaces from South Africa to India. Now, imagine people the size of the Statue of Liberty living next to us. Sounds like science fiction. But for the animal world, this is reality. The world's smallest tortoise species, the speckled tortoise, doesn't grow more than 4 inches long. But the Galapagos Islands are home to giant tortoises that reach the length of 5 feet. They also weigh like a sports bike. The largest of them had an incredible weight of a 1,000 pounds. The giant Galapagos tortoise lives for 100 years and sleeps 16 hours a day. Due to its slow metabolism, the animal may not eat or drink water for a whole year. Millions of years ago, lizards from South America climbed onto a log. Sea waves carried the log to the Pacific Ocean. The lizards traveled hundreds of miles and ended up on the Galapagos Islands. They had to evolve to adapt to new conditions. Scientists believe this is how the marine iguanas appeared. These unique animals look like dangerous dragons. But in fact, they feed on plants and are totally harmless. Iguanas spend most of their lives in water. To get rid of sea salt that accumulates in the body, these animals literally sneeze salt. A chew! The lyrebird lives only in southeastern Australia and the island of Tasmania. The bird has such a strange name because of its tail. It looks like a lyre, a stringed instrument of the ancient Greeks. Lyrebirds are known for their ability to imitate other birds, and not only them. The bird copies animal screams, human voices, chainsaw noises, car and fire alarms, and even the click of a camera. About 12,000 years ago, a salt lake appeared on one of Palau's islands. Today, it's called Jellyfish Lake. This 1,500 by 500 foot reservoir is home to 5 million golden jellyfish. These unique creatures swim to the west shore of the lake every morning. There, jellyfish wait for the sunrise. Then, all day long, they follow the sun. Algae lives in the tissues of the jellyfish, feeding them with energy. These algaes can't live without sunlight. Have you ever seen a skyscraper that can change its shape? The creators of the FNF Tower in Panama City had a concept and only $50 million, which isn't a lot in skyscraper money. So, they couldn't afford a mistake, and they finished a concrete structure with the 39 upper floors rotating 9 degrees around an axis from the first attempt without spending any extra time or materials. Dubai's rotating tower will look different every time you see it once it's finished. Each of its 80 floors will rotate 360 degrees individually around the center of the building. The lucky residents will be able to control that rotation, which means they can choose their view from the window. A complete lap should take about 90 minutes. And no, the tower won't be a huge waste of electricity. It will produce its own energy. Wind turbines between the floors will drive the rotations. If you've ever wanted to live inside a video game, book an apartment in the King Power Mahana Khan building. This pixelated skyscraper around the height of the Eiffel Tower is the tallest building in Thailand. The secret behind its looks is the horizontally and vertically divided glass windows. It took five years to finish this beauty with over 200 apartments, a hotel, luxury shops, restaurants, and one of the most breathtaking viewpoints in the world. The Libyan International Building features one of the world's tallest artificial waterfalls running right down its side. No worries, they only turn it on on special occasions, and it uses a mix of recycled tap water and rainwater. When it started running for the first time, the non-informed locals even reported a huge water leak. The Cyber Texture Office Building in Mumbai looks like a huge egg made of glass and steel. It was actually inspired by a vessel that, like our planet, has its own ecosystem. To bring down the heat levels inside, the architects chose the ideal orientation 
and added sun shading and an underground cooling system. The Marina Bay Sands in Singapore seems like a Stonehenge look-alike, but its architect claims that he was inspired by a house of cards. The horizontal one is balanced on the three vertical ones. They are three 55-story hotels with restaurants, nightclubs, gardens, shops, museums, and movie theaters. The horizontal card is an infinity swimming pool with the best view of the city for up to 4,000 visitors. The pool hangs at the height of the 57th floor, and it feels like nothing is holding it. The dancing house definitely stands out among the more traditional architecture in Prague. The nickname for the house is Fred and Ginger. The stone tower symbolizes the famous dancer Fred Astaire, and the glass tower, his partner, Ginger Rogers. There's even imaginary hair on top of Fred's tower. 99 concrete panels support the dancing shape, all of them of different dimensions. Umeda Sky Building, twice the height of Big Ben, consists of two towers of glass and steel to the north of Osaka Station. The floating garden observatory connects the towers on top. Although the building is in a huge city, the skywalk is so high in the clouds that the only thing you'll hear up there is the wind. If you're scared of heights, you can visit an urban garden, a theater, an art museum, or one of the many offices closer to the ground inside the building. Architect Octavio Mendoza owns probably the largest piece of pottery in the world. If you're ever in Colombia, ask the locals for directions to the Flintstone House. Yes, they call it that for a reason. The official name is Casa Terracotta, and the architect only used clay to build it. He let it bake and harden in the sun, which transformed the pliable material into solid ceramic. Every curve of the building is designed after the surrounding hills. All the furniture inside is also made of clay. Mendoza is determined to work on the casa for the rest of his life. Artists Dennis Sullivan and Francis Conklin have been saving money for 15 years, carving smaller wooden dogs to create their dream project. The Dog Bark Park Inn in Cottonwood is a 12-foot beagle that stands proud in the Idaho prairie. There is a bedroom and a living area in its body and an extra bedroom in the head. Have you ever wondered what it's like to be inside a huge carpet? Eh, me neither. But checking out the Azerbaijan National Carpet Museum is definitely worth it anyway. It shows the history of this important local craft in every detail. Austrian architect Franz Jans designed the construction, and it took six years to finish it. The basket building in Ohio looks exactly like a real shopping basket, except it's 160 times larger. It even has two attached handles. The building served as the headquarters of Longa Burger Basket Company, then was sold to become a luxury hotel. A giant whale? An airship? Can you guess what's inside this building in Graz, Austria? Two British architects won the Europe-wide competition to design this art museum. The biomorphic construction has around 1,000 acrylic glass elements on its skin. During the night, it can send light signals and messages to people on the other side of the river. It takes in daylight from the north through nozzles on its top. The needle is a viewing platform. The Half House in Toronto, Canada was built in the late 19th century and was one of six identical houses standing next to each other. When developers came to this area, the owners of all the other houses agreed to move. And this one wouldn't go. A demolition crew showed some impressive skills as they managed to tear down the neighboring house without doing any damage at all to what is now the half house. The white exterior wall used to be load-bearing, dividing the neighbors' bedrooms and living rooms. One wrong move of the excavator and the entire construction would become ruins. The shell house in Isla Mujeres, Mexico stands by the ocean, was inspired by the ocean, and looks like one of the ocean's symbols. The house is shell-shaped and covered with shells from nearby beaches. Architect Eduardo Ocampo designed this beauty as he wanted to have a one-of-a-kind house for his brother to come and visit more often. Now it's up for rent for vacationers. The Bubble Palace, not far away from Cannes in France, 
was designed by a Hungarian architect and purchased by Pierre Cardin. In case you have a couple of spare million, you can buy this interesting property. You'll get 10 bedroom suites decorated by contemporary artists, gardens, water ponds, a swimming pool, and a 500 seat outdoor auditorium with an awesome view of the Bay of Khan as a bonus. Can you find one house standing straight here? I know, I also failed. All the cubes in the cube house in Rotterdam are tilted 45 degrees at their side. The idea here was to make the most of the space. Dutch architect Piet Blom designed the houses in the late 70s to look like an abstract forest. Each triangular roof represents a treetop. The houses stand at three floors tall with an entrance on the ground floor, an open kitchen, and a living room on the first floor, as well as a bathroom with two bedrooms on the top floor. The Boot in Tasman, New Zealand is a hotel that looks like it comes straight out of a children's book. It even has legit shoelaces. There's a spiral staircase, cozy fireplace, kitchenette, and a bedroom with a balcony. If you ever find yourself in Mitchell, South Dakota, be sure not to miss out on their key tourist attraction, the Corn Palace. The locals have always been so proud of prairie gold that they first built a palace out of corn back in 1892 to prove to the rest of the world how fertile their lands are. What you can see now is the rebuilt version. Every year, they put new corn in 13 shades to form new beautiful murals. Imagine you decided to take a road trip the old-fashioned way. And by that, I mean you decide to do it without the help of any technology. What? So you go to the nearest convenience store and buy a map of each state you plan to pass through. You buckle them up on the passenger seat right next to you and set off on your adventure. During your first week, you arrive in the state of New York. You wave bye-bye to Lady Liberty, eat a slice of pizza, and head upstate. Near the Catskills, you notice you're running low on gas and decide to stop in the nearest town to fill up your tank. You check your map, and it appears that the nearest place is a small village called Aglo, right at the next intersection. You drive a few minutes and pass through a sign that says, Welcome to Aglo, home of the Aglo General Store. Well, this must be it, you think to yourself. But the town is strangely empty. You can't find the store or the gas station you were looking for. There are no houses. You start to think there might be a mistake. Aglo doesn't seem to exist. This story may sound made up, but it could have actually happened to anyone passing through New York a few years ago. Actually, the so-called town of Aglo is what is called a phantom settlement or a paper town. There are several of these around the world, but Aglo is probably the most famous. Paper towns are basically fake towns. That is, they don't really exist. They're made up of Easter eggs put there by map makers as a kind of copyright trap. Maps are tough to make. To create a map from scratch, one has to do years of field work or analysis of satellite photos. That's why plagiarism has always been rampant among map makers. It's pretty easy to redraw the same geographical features from one map onto a new map, and it is hard to get caught. People are, after all, drawing the exact same world. That's why map makers came up with a way to catch individuals stealing their data. Some map makers may include a mountain that is bigger than they are in reality. Others might add a slight turn on a road, where in reality there is none. For example, in the early 1970s, a fake mountain peak appeared on some Boulder County maps. The addition of this previously unknown peak, called Mount Richard, into local maps began to confuse Colorado rock climbers at the time. It turned out that Mount Richard was one of these copyright traps, put there by a local maps man called <laughs> Richard Siachi. Let's just say he must have decided to pay a tribute to himself with this little addition. Now, adding a paper town is perhaps one of the most extreme solutions, one that map makers hope goes unnoticed. But that's not what usually happens, which leads us back to the Aglo story. Map makers Ernest Alperts and Otto Lindbergh from the CDG, General Drafting Corporation, were part of the largest map publishers of the 1930s. Back then, the company was commissioned to create a map of the state of New York. That's when the two men had an idea. In order to prevent copyright infringement, they would create a phantom settlement combining parts of their names together. 
they came up with the strange name Aglo and added the fake town along Route 206 near the water reservoir of Catskills in upstate New York. The area was supposed to be, in reality, a dirt road. Years later, Rand McNally, another map designing company, produced a map of New York that included a town called Aglo in the same location where CDG had originally placed it. Lindbergh was convinced that he had a copyright case against his competitor, but the story just kept getting more complicated. Both companies went to settle the case in court. But as it turned out, McNally had a legitimate reason for adding Aglo to their version of a New York map. You see, in order to fabricate their maps, McNally did a thorough research on real estate and establishments located in each existing town. And as it turned out, Aglo was not an empty town when they drew their map. Records show that the town housed an establishment named Aglo General Store. Sure, it was the only building in town, but that was enough for the mapmakers to believe that such a town really existed. They added Aglo to the map like they would add any other town with physical establishments. It seemed they weren't infringing any copyright if this once phantom settlement had somehow come to life. The plot twist is that CDG's Alpers and Lindbergh could never have foreseen that someone would decide to occupy a made-up town. But it happened. One day, someone bought a map from a regional gas station that had Aglo marked on it. The person wanted to open a store more or less where Aglo existed, so they decided to name the store after the town it was in. They trusted the accuracy of the map they bought and named their business Aglo General Store. After all, why would there be a non-existent town on an official map? The general store didn't last many years, only enough to turn this story into a mess. On the bright side, (laughs) This whole debacle turned Aglo into a super-famous fictitious settlement. It became a tourist spot, with people driving from all over the U.S. to get a picture of the town's welcome sign. Now, as we said before, paper towns are plenty around the world and over time, too. A 2005 BBC documentary revealed that the city of London alone had over 100 tiny fake streets or paper streets around the city. For instance, the so-called Moat Lane, is supposedly a curving road in Finchley, North London. But if you ever decide to go visit, you'll find nothing but trees and gardens. And what about Argleton, a town in the north of England? Or, more accurately, an empty field in northeastern England? Argleton existed for a while on Google Maps. There were hotel listings and apartments for rent in town. Well, the only thing is that they weren't really in Argleton, but rather in nearby settlements. It's believed that Google Maps imported these fake streets into its database as they used renowned copyrighted atlases as their sources. But as the truth about these paper streets surfaced, the company later deleted them. If we turn back the clock a few hundred years, we'll find another mystery story involving a possible phantom settlement. But this isn't a tiny town at an intersection, but rather an entire island. Bermejo Island was speculated to be a tiny inhabited island. It appeared on many maps of the 16th and 17th centuries and was a hot spot for Spanish explorers. Its location sometimes varied slightly from map to map, and occasionally its name appeared as Vermija, but its existence seemed certain enough. It wasn't until the 18th century that the island stopped being depicted in maps altogether. This island's last appearance dates back to a 1921 edition of a Mexican atlas, and then poof. It dropped out of the horizon altogether. The case of Mexico's disappeared island has raised many questions. Did it sink? Was it destroyed? Are people simply looking for it in the wrong place? Three official investigations took place in 2009 to locate the island. They used high-end technologies, scouring Mexico's oceans and seabeds. Yet, Bermija remained nowhere to be found. One can't help but wonder if the island ever existed at all. Similar to modern-day mapmakers, 16th and 17th century mapmakers had their way to trick map users. Instead of copyright traps, these fake towns or even fake islands served as a way to fool and confuse enemies and unwanted voyagers. Since a long time has gone by, it's hard to know whether Bermija was just another phantom settlement. It stopped being depicted on maps, but this mysterious case still leaves people baffled and confused.
Researchers have found almost 1,000 previously hidden Maya settlements in the tropical lowlands of what is now northern Guatemala. They did it with LIDAR, light detection and ranging lasers, which they used to scan areas from the air. The region we're talking about is pretty vast. All those structures and buildings they saw over there stretch across about 650 square miles. And these spots were supposedly occupied thousands of years ago. It seems all these structures were pretty densely packed, so people lived close to each other. They had at least 417 ancient villages, towns, and cities where they could identify boundaries. These structures and buildings were actually a part of a state that looked like a kingdom. Some of these settlements were built as sports courts, civic, ceremonial, and religious centers, and residential homes. There were also massive palaces, platforms, dams, pyramids, and causeways across that area. People who lived there also had reservoirs where they collected water. So, they needed the power to organize thousands of specialists and workers. And they also needed many skilled people to build such structures without the technologies we have today. They needed lime producers, architects, mortar and quarry specialists, lithic technicians, those who took care of legal enforcement, and other important roles to establish the true community. This cool laser scanning system researchers used while exploring this area can even penetrate very dense ecosystems and vegetation. The light bounces off different surfaces and then creates a digitally reconstructed map. This map is based on how much time it takes for the pulses to get back to a receiver. So, with this laser system, they discovered they were also lowlands for agriculture. So why exactly did the Maya settle in this region? It was a specific area. Plus, it was hard to build such an amazing kingdom in a tropical rainforest climate. Back in the old times, ancient peoples had mostly inhabited areas in drier climates. Over there, they would build water resources, which were some sort of the basis of society and a source of life. An example of this is Teotihuacan of Highland, Mexico, although they did have a couple of navigable rivers they could use for transport and trade. But these rainforest areas had their advantages too. The Maya used natural resources like limestone, which was their primary building material, salt, and the volcanic rock obsidian, which they used for different tools. Also, they managed to find enough dry land to live and build homes there. The lowlands were seasonal swamps called bajos, and they were perfect for agriculture because of the fertile soil. Generally, the Maya built settlements that could endure rainy periods too. They were ready for different circumstances, including flood and drought, which is something you could see in how they built houses. Their architecture was also one piece of evidence that showed their community was like a centralized kingdom-like state, which shows they stuck together through tough times. The Mayan Empire was very powerful, and it reached its peak about the 6th century CE. They were excellent at pottery, agriculture, writing, mathematics, and calendars. They were the ones who created complex calendar systems, such as the Calendar Round, which is based on 365 days. Although some believe the Mayan calendar predicted December 21, 2012 would be the end of the world, it was just a coincidence with the end of a certain full cycle. They would call it the Long Count Calendar, and it lasts 5,125 years. The Mayan people left behind an impressive amount of astonishing architecture and symbolic artwork. Most of their stone cities ended up abandoned by 900 CE. No one still knows why the Mayan civilization in that area collapsed, although there are some theories. Some think that by the 9th century, these people had exhausted the resources around them to the point that they could no longer feed and sustain such a big population. Others believe some city-states didn't get along that well, so they broke down the traditional system of power they used to have. Some say it was all because of a very long period of drought. It could be a combination of all these factors, though. But one Mayan city, located on an island, even survived until the 17th century. It was long after the rest of the Mayan civilizations had been destroyed or abandoned. If you're a traveler, you might know the town by its modern name, Flores. 
Scientists believe about 2,000 people lived there. The earliest Maya people were farmers. They cultivated crops like beans, squash, corn, and cassava. As they had many interesting ingredients, they created hundreds of cool recipes. Many of those are still present even today. For example, in modern Mexican cooking, and especially popular are papayas, cacao, avocados, squash, pineapples, chili peppers, beans, and so on. Even though the Maya mostly practiced a kind of primitive type of slash-and-burn agriculture, there is also evidence of them using some more advanced farming methods, like terracing and irrigation. And they were big chocolate lovers. More than 3,500 years ago, the Olmecs of Mesoamerica probably turned out to be the first to realize that it takes some work for us to get such a cool thing as chocolate. But the Maya were the ones who turned it into a true form of art. Scientists found out about it when they found cacao in Mayan pottery. Their chocolate would be mixed with honey, water, cornmeal, and chili peppers. That's how you get a spicy, savory, hot chocolate beverage you can try even today in Mexico and Central America. Also, they used written language in their books. Their paper was made from fig tree bark, and using strips of that paper, they created a large library of books. Books made of this material are called codices, and four of these can still be found today. Sadly, many books were lost over time because of the humid climate or some human factors. The classic Maya built a bunch of palaces and temples that had a stepped pyramid shape. They decorated them with inscriptions and reliefs which have earned them the reputation of being incredible artists of Mesoamerica. For the Mayans, flat foreheads were the most desirable thing on someone's face. They were generally really into aesthetics, and having a flat forehead was one of the main things where you could meet their highest aesthetic standard. They also liked to glam up their looks with makeup and clothing. Also, the Mayans were master tattoo artists. Actually, they were one of the first civilizations that started doing such forms of body art. They had a rich culture and believed in many things, such as fairies. Many civilizations across the globe believed in these mythical creatures, which had different names everywhere. The Mayans called those creatures aluxes. They would make sculptures of aluxes from wood or clay, take them to the forest, and hide in some secret spots. The Maya believed these sculptures would come to life during the night and take the role of guardians of their land, animals, and crops. The Maya believed caves were entrances that led to the underworld. You can even visit some of these caves if you like. For example, you can explore the jungles of Quintana Roo and Yucatan near Cancun. There are many spots where researchers found artifacts the Mayans had left behind. They were one of the first cultures that learned how to use rubber latex and make, for example, rubber balls for the many interesting games they had. They used natural latex and then probably mixed it with some other natural substances. That's how they came up with the bouncy balls they played with. They also built cool steam baths. The Maya had structures made from stone that looked like something we know today as bathtubs. Plus, they were building heated stone structures we know as sweat houses. Researchers found these in El Salvador and Guatemala, and they were previously hidden under volcanic ash. Can you tell me what date it is today? Piece of cake. You just look at your smartphone and voila, you immediately know the day, month, and year. But was it always this easy to tell the date? Did the ancient people even have the concept of a year that lasts 365 days? Yes and no. Mayan calendars had cycles. That's close to what we call a year. But the Mayan cycle was much longer, 819 days. And this is where the mystery begins. 819 days compared to what? When does this calendar begin and when does it end? Scientists were asking themselves this question for decades. They discovered and deciphered the Mayan calendar during the 1940s. Recently, two American scientists, John Linden and Victoria Bricker, came forward with a solution. So, what did they do differently from their predecessors? The duo deciphered the code by broadening their thinking. 
They expanded the calendar from 819 days to full 45 years. That's 20 times longer than the original cycle. And a pattern started to emerge. This was a major breakthrough because the Maya told time in a complicated way. You can forget about the easy-to-read Arabic numerals we have today. These ancient people used glyphs. These are tiny images that represent characters. Something like the icons on your desktop or universal symbols. When you see a little dot with three curved lines above it, you know there is a Wi-Fi network available. The Mayan calendar used glyphs that represented animals or natural phenomena. For example, there were symbols for a jaguar and an eagle. Each glyph marked one day. Each cycle is repeated four times, 8 and 19, x 4. Let's call these four cycles blocks. The Mayas colored each block differently. Scientists thought these colors corresponded to the four cardinal directions. Red was east, white, north. West was black and finally, yellow marked south. But then the 1980s came. Yeah, this was a weird decade. The calculations were all wrong. Researchers determined that the colors were associated with the position of the sun in the sky. It turned out that the color yellow represented the highest point of the sun, which is called a zenith. White was the lowest point, called the nadir. It seems that the calendar showed just how good the ancient Mayas were at astronomy. This is most evident at Chichen Itza. This principal Mayan city is located on the Yucatan Peninsula, Mexico. There stands an impressive step pyramid. It is dedicated to the feathered serpent deity, and its alignment is perfect. Something marvelous happens here twice a year, during the equinoxes, March and September. These are the times when the sun shines directly over the equator. On these two dates, the day and night last the same. At the site of the pyramid, sunlight first illuminates the sculpture of the serpent head at the base of the structure. Then it makes its way up the 91 steps. This creates the illusion that a snake is slithering down the pyramid. Even today, people gather to witness the site. And it must have been more impressive when the Mayas completed the structure 1050-1300 CE. Do you know what a synodic period is? Neither do I. But Mayan astronomers did. A synodic period is the time that passes before a stellar body does a full lap. For example, this is the period between two full moons. When you look from Earth, this period lasts roughly 30 days. And the Mayas were looking at the skies non-stop. They carefully noted the synodic periods of all planets. From Venus to Saturn, these ancient astronomers kept records of nearly all celestial bodies. But what does this have to do with their calendar? The American researchers' calculations revealed the link. Let's take the planet closest to the Sun as an example, Mercury. Its synodic period is 117 days. Multiply that by 7 and you get which number? Exactly 8 to 19, 117 x 7 equals sign 819. Coincidence? Definitely not. Because synodic periods of other planets also neatly match the magical figure, 819. But this is not visible from a single Mayan cycle. Scientists had to expand it several times to discover the pattern. There is a reason why no one could decipher the code for so long. They were focused on a single planet. The trick was to add the Mayan calculation for all the planets. Researchers just needed to see the bigger picture. This brings us to the year 2012. Can you remember that some people thought that the world would end on December 21st? That turned out to be a bust. We are alive and well now. But what started this false rumor? The Mayan calendar, of course. You see, these ancient people based their calendar on long periods of all the planets. That included a lot of complicated math and a lot of multiplying. This 2012 was simply the time when their cycle ended. It is known as the long count. This period is the same as our year. For the Mayas, 2012 was something like the 31st of December for us. Just an end of a cycle in which they measured time, so there was no need to panic. Those New Year's Eve parties might be a bit wild, but the world doesn't end on January 1st. The Mayas stretched more than their calendar. Rubber was the name of the game. Yes, you've heard it correctly. These ancient people were making different grades of rubber 3,000 years before one famous American did, Charles Goodyear. They would extract natural latex from the rubber tree. This is a milky substance that can be turned into rubber. And they weren't the only ones. Scientists found evidence that their neighbors, the Aztecs and the Olmecs, did the same. But what did they do with rubber? They didn't need car tires, definitely. But it's cool to have a nice pair of sandals for the beach. The Spanish wrote about rubber sole footwear that natives wore. Sadly, scientists still haven't found them. 
that would be a big step for archaeology. So the Maya were playful with rubber, literally. Researchers guessed that they produced balls from latex. These were bouncy and ranged in size from a softball to a soccer ball. A typical Mayan ball game, pits, involved two hoops. You must be thinking basketball, but not quite. The hoops were set on walls, 23 feet high. Compare that to the NBA standard of 10 feet. And the hoop was the other way around. There is also a sweet side to the story of the Mayas. These ancient people enjoyed chocolate. In fact, the modern word chocolate probably comes from their language, socolatl. This meant bitter water. Okay, you get the bitter part, but why water? The Mayas didn't produce chocolate in the form we know it today. They didn't make bars of chocolate, they drank it. Smashed cocoa beans made for excellent drinks. The Mayas perfected the mixture over time and even added spices. Anyone up for a fiery chocolate drink with stew peppers and cornmeal? Who knows, maybe this beverage actually tasted well. Cocoa beans were sacred and used as a currency. Researchers believe all social classes got to enjoy it. Free chocolate for all sounds nice even today. But where did the Mayas get clean water for their cocoa drinks? From the oldest known filtration system in the Western Hemisphere. It was based on zeolite. These are minerals that contain aluminum and silicone compounds. And guess what? Modern air and water purifiers still use this material. Mayan tech wins yet again. Back in Europe, Roger Bacon developed a sand filtration system in 1627, some 1,800 years after the Mayas. But what about regions without rivers, lakes, or springs? Mayan engineers had it all figured out. Rainwater. They would carve out large reservoirs in the limestone bedrock. Then, they would coat these underground caves with a layer of a watertight material. The final step was to make small channels that collected water from the hills above. Scientists estimated that just one of these reservoirs could hold on average 10,000 gallons of rainwater, enough to fill 55 modern hot tubs. So, imagine you're 15 and you get bored of playing video games. Instead, to pass the time, you decide to give some attention to an old hobby of yours, tracking down lost Mayan cities. You've heard that some ancient civilizations are said to have built entire cities based on constellations, so you decide to check out whether that was true for the Mayans. You find a book containing all the constellations the Mayan civilization believed to exist. You open good old Google Maps and map every ancient Mayan city discovered today. You start seeing that this information actually matches. And truly, the biggest ancient Mayan cities correspond to the brightest and biggest stars of the Mayan constellations. Okay, this is getting interesting. You manage to map out over 100 ancient cities when you suddenly notice something strange. There's an area in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico where archaeologists have unearthed two Mayan cities. But on the constellation map, there are three stars. Could this mean there is a long-lost city waiting to be discovered nearby? You might think this sounds too daydreamy, but the story is actually true. The previous account happened to a Canadian teenager named William Gaddery. The boy is known as a science genius and had even won an award for the constellation theory we presented just now. When he noticed that a third city was missing from the 23rd constellation he was examining, he began to scour the internet for satellite pictures that could help him solve this mystery. He looked into images from NASA, JAXA, a Japan-based satellite company, and Google Earth. These images were still insufficient to answer his questions, so he reached out to a friend inside the Canadian Space Agency. His friend provided him with state-of-the-art satellite imagery that gave him the answer he was looking for. According to the images, there is a large square area right on the border of Mexico and Belize which looks like the remains of a city. William took the images to a remote sensing expert known as Dr. Armin LaRogue from the University of New Brunswick. They studied the images thoroughly and concluded that the area could be housing 30 buildings and even a large pyramid. The scientific and archaeological community went crazy with the 15-year-old's discovery. Could this really be true? Some background. Lost Mayan cities began to be unearthed in the mid-20th century. Since then, ruins from cities such as Tikal, Palenik, and Uxmal have been rediscovered. The Mayans were one of the biggest pre-Columbian civilizations living in the Americas. 
They began to settle in the area as early as 1500 BCE. Experts believe that at its height, the Mayan civilization consisted of over 40 cities with a population of millions of people. That's a crowd. And their cities were pretty interesting. Their civilization spanned over Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, Guatemala, and Belize. They survived mainly on agriculture, so they developed a complex irrigation system in most of their cities. They built a series of ceremonial buildings, pyramids, plazas, and even courts for ball games. The Mayans were keen pyramid builders, but they also developed an advanced astronomical system. With whatever ancient technology they had, they were able to predict the exact location of planets, such as Venus and Mars, and they were able to predict the exact dates of eclipses. That's why the methodology William used to discover this long-lost Mayan city was unusual, but not completely surreal. The Mayans were keen astronomers, so it wouldn't be too strange that they built their major architectural feats in relation to the sky, would it? And they wouldn't be the first ones to be doing so. There is a famous fringe of Egyptology dedicated to studying how the Giza pyramids were built in perfect alignment with the Orion constellation, meaning that each pyramid was purposely built to align with one of the major stars of Orion's belt. According to William, he first had the idea to look at the Mayan constellations because he couldn't understand why the Mayans built their cities where they built them. Most major cities, such as Chichen Itza and Uxmal, aren't near any rivers or significant bodies of water. Instead, they're built on marginal lands and on top of mountains, which confused the 15-year-old. His next thought was that it might have something to do with astronomy. William named the new city he discovered Mouth of Fire, which is also my nickname, and he even won a merit award for his hard work. However, his theory was very much contested inside the archaeological community, and many Mayan experts worked to debunk William's findings. Some archaeologists say that constellation theories are too unscientific. Anthony Aveni, a renowned anthropologist and astronomer, referred to William's methodology as an act of creative imagination. He explained that there is no way to be sure what the Mayan constellations really were. It's all just hypothetical. Another debunking of William's findings came from Mayanist David Stewart, who said that the object identified on the satellite imagery is nothing but an old cornfield. His claim was supported by an expedition that took place near the area in 2021, when the archaeologists present reported there was nothing at all in this area. Still, a 15-year-old boy almost found a long-lost Mayan city, which is pretty exciting if you ask me. Similar techniques as those used by William are actually being used to unearth lost civilizations all over the world. According to space archaeologist Sarah Parquet, satellite imagery has been a key player in discovering ancient cities in Egypt and other places. Sarah herself spends most of her days scouring images for any sign of where there could have been cities long ago. What happens, she says, is that any time you have something buried, it's going to be covered either by vegetation, soil or sand, or some other modern construction on top of it. In order to assess whether there is something hidden under large canopies of vegetation or not, she uses infrared technology, for instance. A major recent discovery in Brazil was done in a similar way. Satellite imagery detected a network of trenches dating back to 200 to 1200 CE. These suggest settlements that could have supported around 60,000 people. But in this case, the satellite imagery did indeed correspond to what was on the ground. Researchers from the University of Florida found several mounds that were accompanied by ditches and geoglyphs. Archaeologists also found remnants of carefully designed walls, centered around plazas, much like the type of construction done by the ancient Mayans. Advances in satellite tech have also shed new light on long-discovered ancient Mayan cities, such as Tikal. Located in the heart of the Guatemalan jungle, Tikal is believed to have been the capital of the ancient Mayan empire. At its height, it was comparable in importance to cities such as London or New York in today's world. It was composed of a series of complex monuments, many of them believed to have been the resting places of kings and chiefs. Tikal is already known to have been big, 
but recent discoveries show it could have been even three times larger than what scientists originally believed. The main discovery revolves around a fortification on the outskirts of the city, indicating how far the original city stretched. And new discoveries still take place. In 2017, researchers also unearthed new clues regarding the potential causes of the decline of the Mayan civilization. Using data from a site in Siwol, located 62 miles southwest of Tikal, scientists analyzed radiocarbon data from ceramics and archaeological excavations to extract new information about the sudden demise of this great civilization. The information shows that, instead of a sudden collapse, the Mayans most likely collapsed in waves of social instability and political crises. These events are believed to have deteriorated Mayan city centers and began causing the dispersion of the Mayan population. Well, it seems like it's a prime time to uncover ancient ruins. What do you say? Will you give it a try as well? Imagine discovering an ancient city without leaving the comfort of your home. In 1963, a man in the Nevsihir province of Turkey did exactly that. He was renovating his house. He knocked down a wall in his basement and found a mysterious room. He continued digging and saw a tunnel. This is how Derinkuyu Underground City was found. Derinkuyu is one of the deepest multi-level underground settlements of Cappadocia and in all of Turkey. This engineering masterpiece has eight levels. The inhabitants living on those floors had access to cellars, storage areas, chapels, a school, a study room, and other structures. All floors are connected by an extensive network of tunnels. It's believed that the underground city was built as a shelter. You can't see the construction from the outside. Its depth is approximately 279 feet. The complex was large enough to shelter about 20,000 people, plus their livestock and food supplies. There's also a 180-foot ventilation shaft. People used it both for ventilation and as a well. The well supplied water both to the villagers living on the surface and to those hiding in the underground city. Interestingly, those living on the bottom levels were able to cut off the water supply for the upper and ground levels. This kept the water safe from potential poisoning. The place was designed for protection. The tunnels could be blocked from the inside with huge round rolling stone doors. The passageways were extremely narrow. Potential invaders had to enter the tunnels one at a time. Seems like they thought of everything in the 7th century BCE. Archaeologists believed the Phrygians were the ones who first built the levels. After them, the structure was used and enhanced in Roman times. This was when the chapels were added. The golden time of Darin Kuyu, however, was during the Byzantine era. But how did these people manage to create such tunnels? Well, the rock they carved them into wasn't usual. It was soft volcanic rock. It appeared due to a geological process that began millions of years ago. Volcanic eruptions covered the area in thick ash. It then solidified into this soft rock. When the natural forces of wind and water eroded softer parts, only hard elements remained. Fun fact, fairy chimneys are also made of intricately shaped volcanic soft rock, but they formed naturally without any human intervention. I'm still in Turkey, but this time, my destination is Kanakale, where a myth came to life. For 3,000 years, people believed that Homer's Iliad was fiction and that Troy never existed. In 1863, everything changed. Expatriate Frank Calvert discovered ancient ruins in western Turkey. He was convinced they belonged to the ancient city of Troy. Heinrich Schliemann examined this area in 1868. That's when Troy saw sunlight again after all those centuries. Troy has complex layers. Over the years, nine ancient cities were built on top of one another. Historians say that the area was strategically located between Europe and Asia, so it became a prosperous trade and cultural center. This strategic position made Troy attractive throughout history. After the Trojan conflict, the city was abandoned between the years 1100 to 700 BCE. Then Greek settlers rediscovered the area, and Alexander the Great ruled there. 
the Romans then invaded the city. Speaking of this event, the first thing you would see when visiting the site is a replica of the wooden Trojan horse from a movie shot in 2004. The next stop is Lothal. In the 1950s, Lothal and several other Harappan sites were discovered in India. These new provinces extended the boundaries of the Indus Valley civilization. Lothal was an important part of the Harappan civilization. It had vast cotton and rice fields. Plus, it had a bead-making factory. Beads were made from semi-precious stones, like agate. Many of these beads were later found in Mesopotamia, which serves as evidence that Lothal was a thriving trading port. Archaeologists believe that the city was part of an ancient trade route. Traces of agriculture? Check. Traces of trade? Check. What else? The remains of residential buildings, streets, bathing pavements, and drains. Some real city planning, and impressive examples of early urbanization. The town was well constructed. There were modern houses. Some of them had six rooms, bathrooms, a large courtyard, and even a veranda. Lothal also had the world's oldest known dock. It linked the city with the Sabarmati River and the trade route. The ancient Mayan city of Calakmul is located in southern Mexico in the tropical forest of the Tierras Bajas. From 500 CE to 800 CE, Calakmul was home to over 50,000 people. There was a central plaza surrounded by outer districts. And if we count both the inhabitants of all those outer areas and those who lived in the center, Calakmul had a population of more than 1.5 million people. It was a city that was habitable for 12 centuries. It's believed that the place had more constructions than any other excavated Maya settlements in the region. After 1000 CE, the Maya civilization there faced a downfall. The settlement that was once the center of Mesoamerica was almost completely abandoned. The ancient city was at the heart of the second largest tropical forest in America. The site is well preserved, so today, if you were to visit it, you would be able to picture what life looked like in ancient Mayan times. The city remains include architectural complexes and sculpted monuments, defensive systems, quarries, water management features, agricultural terraces, massive temple pyramids, and palaces. Not to mention a variety of body ornaments and other accompanying objects. It proves that complex state-organized societies lived in this tropical forest. The Mayans depicted nature in their paintings, pottery, sculptures, rituals, and even food. I'm moving on to a place people thought didn't really exist. The city of Thonis Heracleon appeared only in a few inscriptions and ancient texts. Turns out, it was waiting to be discovered for thousands of years. Scientists searched the majority of the coast of Egypt, but then, Archaeologist Frank Gaudio and his team detected a colossal face looking at them from under the water. The ancient city of Heracleion was discovered completely submerged four miles off Alexandria's coast. In the ruins of the lost city, there were 64 ships, 700 anchors, and a treasure trove of gold coins. Archaeologists consider a 16-foot tall statue and the temple remains the most important findings discovered by the expedition. Back then, the city had ceremonies and celebrations that took place in the Temple of Amun. The ruins and artifacts were made from granite and diorite, so they were in good condition even after having been in contact with water for centuries. They give people a glimpse into what life was like 2,300 years ago in one of the most important trade ports of the world. The city had a network of canals. You can think of it as an ancient Egyptian Venice. The canals linked many separate harbors and anchorages. Towers, temples, houses, and other structures were also linked by bridges. Thonis Heracleion was the country's main port for international trade and the collection of taxes. No one really knows how the city ended up submerged, but archaeologists connect it with natural causes. At the end of the second century BCE, most probably after a flood, Heracleion got covered with water. Then, Alexandria, the city founded by Alexander the Great, became more glorious than Heracleion. Before Alexandria's fame, 
Heraklion was the main port of entry to Egypt. So, after the disaster, many ships heading for Heraklion had to change their route and go to Alexandria. Heraklion lost its glory until its rediscovery in 1933. Mesa Verde is an American national park in Colorado. The park is the largest archaeological preserve in the U.S., with more than 5,000 sites, including 600 cliff dwellings. Mesa Verde means green table in Spanish. The name comes from the shape of the mountains in the area, with flat tops and steep sides. The park is an ancestral Puebloan archaeological site. Starting from 7500 BCE, a group of nomadic Paleo-Indians seasonally lived in Mesa Verde. They were hunters, gatherers, and crop farmers. They built the first Pueblos in the region. By the end of the 12th century, the Mesa Verdeans began constructing massive cliff dwellings, which are now the best-known structures in the park. We just can't get enough of Mars, can we? Everyone wants to go there, and astronauts are now looking at caves on the red planet where they can live once people inhabit it. The planet itself has some similar characteristics to Earth. Yeah, it's somewhat smaller than Earth, but the time it takes for the planets to revolve around themselves is also similar, which is about a day. On paper, Mars might seem like a good idea given some similarities to Earth, but there are some factors we need to pay attention to before we consider stepping foot there. The temperature. Mars might look like a scorching hot planet like a freakishly large Sahara desert, but quite the opposite. It's really cold. Mars has a reputation for being a freezing, desolate, endless land that happens to have the largest mountain in our solar system thus far. So, within those mountains, astronauts and scientists are considering whether naturally built caves are the answer to our survival. Caves won't be the worst thing we'd live in considering our ancestors used to dwell in caves in communities. Logically, it's the best place to stay dry during a storm and keep warm. It's the best place for protection against predators like giant birds, elephants, and saber-toothed cats. We even had our first art shows in caves with evidence of cave art dated thousands of years ago. Caves are a good idea, and they can also help us save a lot of money when establishing a colony on Mars. Rather than building a fresh structure in the middle of an open plain, the cave structure will help and influence the architecture, potentially saving lots and lots of money. Going to Mars will be expensive. It's already expensive sending people to the moon and launching a rocket into space. So we have to consider the logistics. Another thing to look out for is caves in the ground that are not necessarily stuck on mountains. Scientists believe that most potential places for humans to thrive are caves. These spaces are large enough to host large populations. So far, they identified nine caves as large as football fields. So what would life look like if we lived in caves on Mars? For one thing, sunlight would be hard to access. By the time we reach Mars, we would have the best technology to maximize our lifespan in a hostile environment, which means withstanding the harsh sun rays of Mars. Most likely, we would dig through the caves further underground where oxygen would be pumped for everyone to breathe. People can walk around casually, thinking they're on Earth, and to exit the caves, you would need to wear a special suit. These cave colonies would have dormitories for people to live in and special spaces for colony meetings, entertainment, grocery markets, schools, and other places that are needed to sustain a colony. There would also be indoor farms to grow crops and raise livestock. A team of experts mapped out what some of the dwellings will look like on Mars. And just like on Earth, we will have apartments for young professionals, family homes, and luxury mansions. Some of the dwelling units would be placed on the surface and not in caves. One of the key elements of the design and architecture is how to build it around the natural light to brighten up the homes. Another element is how to deflect radiation and cosmic rays. Because Mars has such a thin atmosphere, sun rays and other hazardous objects easily enter Mars. The dwelling units also have to be sturdy to protect them from severe dust storms and extreme cold temperatures. Some of the living pods or dwelling units that are for couples or singles would have tunnels leading to a shared workspace and garden. Studies show that even being in the presence of greenery can reduce stress levels significantly. 
and on the red planet, we would definitely need some greenery. We can expect the family homes to be built within the caves, not necessarily underground. It would be tempting to head outside with the view of Mars, but the large thick glass would prevent anything from coming in and out. Those who are underground with a view rely on LEDs and camera systems to screen the surface landscape of Mars so it acts like real windows. And if you're bored of the surface, you can always switch the channel and watch something else as you please. Maybe a flowing river surrounded by trees. Or maybe a penthouse view of all of New York. The choice is yours. There would be a driveway that leads to a garage so one can enter and exit easily. There won't really be a reason to exit the cave colony except probably to visit other cave colonies. In this case, we would have highly crafted vehicles that will take people from colony to colony on the surface. The vehicles can withstand harsh temperatures and would be constantly transporting people daily. Some people might live in a certain colony and have to commute to work every day in other colonies. Humans might not have to be working in dangerous conditions or on the surface. We would have robots that will do that for us. The thing about robots is that they don't need to be human-shaped to do a job. However, before transporting humans to space, we would need to create some human-like robots and land them on Mars. With the exact physical form, we can determine what would happen to people if they were on Mars. We would have robots for specific tasks, helping us with everything. Let's not forget artificial intelligence plays a major role in monitoring the systems and updating the functionalities of the colony. It'll know when certain systems need fixing, adjusting, renewing, and changing. We also need people to keep an eye out for anything out of the ordinary and also to make sure people are behaving and not breaking the law. Getting to Mars would be the earliest obstacle we will face. We've already launched some robots to explore the terrain and conduct some studies. At first, we would send robots to test the conditions and to build most of the infrastructure. To build a proper colony, we would have to send out young couples willing to dedicate their lives to the future and the future of their children. It won't be easy. In fact, there would be a variety of people with different professions and specializations to help establish the colony. People would have to work and establish a local economy. We would need scientists, doctors, farmers, teachers for the children, and engineers to maintain the structure. It will take time for the colony to reach a substantial size, but it's all part of the process. Even the spaceships would need to be large and sufficient to house thousands of people traveling from Earth. Of course, by then, most of the dwelling units would have been built, and people would have already picked out their houses, depending on if they were single or if they were about to start a family. Once the colony has the necessary professionals it needs, then come the other people who wish to start their life on Mars. People would need entertainment, so musicians would find a place in the colony. We can't expect everyone to go out on a nice sunny day to the beach, but perhaps one day, when the colony is large enough, there can be an artificial body of water with the same elements as the beach. Livestock animals would also be shipped from Earth to be raised on Mars, where they can populate for our nourishment. We can also bring most of the animals and establish a wildlife sanctuary for everyone to enjoy and for the animals to thrive. For now, humans are planning on reaching the Red Planet sooner than we think. And who knows, maybe you can be one of the first people to sign up and have your own little dwelling unit far away from Earth. There are many miles of undiscovered areas beneath the crust we can't even come close to. Scientists found what appears to be underground mountains buried inside the mantle. Our planet is divided into three layers, the crust, the mantle, and the core. The crust is where 8 billion people, trillions of trees, and millions of animals live and thrive. There are also different types of crust in the land and the ocean. The oceanic crust contains unique rocks and is denser than the land crust. We all see how the Earth is divided and color-coded to show the crust, mantle, and core in textbooks. But there are also special layers in between that not everyone talks about. The mantle is divided into the upper and lower part, which is the transition zone. Since the mantle acts as the geological recycling center, the plate tectonics don't only move side to side, but up and down. 
It's actually why all the volcanoes appeared. The magma spews out to the surface, or even underwater, and then sinks back down and repeats. The transitions go down 250 miles, and then 410 miles. And in this bottom layer, scientists keep discovering the hidden landscapes. The mountains in the mantle are more rugged and much larger than the ones on the crust. Scientists found a mountain range with peaks higher than Mount Everest. Some of them are as high as 600 miles. When the continents were still landlocked together, there may have been some hidden lands now underwater. Theories suggest that Iceland used to be part of a larger microcontinent, Icelandia, which connected present-day Iceland with Greenland and Scandinavia. The idea digs even deeper to a greater Icelandia, which includes Britain. But after the split, these bigger lands sunk with everything in it. There are also theories about New Zealand being part of Zealandia, a hidden microcontinent within the same region. So it could be that these mountains used to be part of old Earth that are underground over the billions of years of natural occurrences. But still, it isn't very likely. One theory is that these underground mountain ranges could be leftover slabs of rock that descended from the surface to the transition zone from the moving of the tectonic plates. As they sink, the large pieces break down into smaller ones, and as they compile over the millions of years, they form what appears to be underground mountains. Since the mantle is the geologic recycling zone, it's likely that the rocks down there used to be part of the surface. They weren't large pieces of land that got hidden, just like dogs hide bones in the garden. But it takes way more time to hide mountains. Some parts of the mantle appear to be smooth, while others aren't so much. The parts that have a cluster of rocks could contain hidden elements in the underground mountains. The smoother parts don't have much seismic or volcanic activity, while the rough parts do. The best way to study those underground landscapes is to wait for an earthquake or a volcano eruption to happen. Seismologists can observe the Earth's interior with special scanners, just like doctors use ultrasound to examine a patient. They can even see minor details and not huge chunks of rocks. A strong enough earthquake can send shockwaves to the Earth's interior, even through the core and back up to the surface. Depending on where they occur, Seismologists can observe and study the intensity of the waves as they move back and forth. On smooth rocks, the waves can travel in a straight line, but once they reach a rough area, the waves tend to scatter. The temperature and composition of the materials can make the waves move faster or slower. But this info isn't exactly accurate and won't contribute a lot to the actual data of the underground mountains. So by analyzing the scattered waves on ships, and utilizing the Earth's magnetic field, scientists can figure out everything they need to know. But these studies are only good enough to figure out the interior in today's state, not how the Earth changed over the past 4.5 billion years. However, scientists are certain that mantle material still dates back to the beginning of Earth's original formation. The question, why not just dig a hole to the center of the Earth and see what's going on down there, might seem logical. The deepest hole humans have dug so far is the Kola Deep Borehole in the Russian Arctic that goes more than 40,000 feet deep. The locals claim they can actually hear screaming coming from below. It took almost 20 years to drill as far as they went, but it's literally merely scratching the surface of what's underneath. They dug about one-third of the crust, which is only 0.2% to the center of the Earth. Getting there is beyond us just like trying to reach the sun. No human can handle the amount of pressure down there. Going down the Mariana Trench, the Earth's deepest point, requires special gear to withstand all the immense pressure. It'll cost a fortune to build that tech to get us to the center of our planet. Evidence of diamonds buried deep in Brazil shows that everything we do on the crust's surface can affect things miles below, even towards the mantle. Scientists dug up six diamonds that could hold tiny mineral grains. As they're called in the mineral world, these inclusions have a chemistry composition where they originated deep in the Earth. Typical diamonds are formed at depths less than 125 miles in the upper mantle, where it's extremely hot. 
the high pressure and boiling temperature down crystallizes carbon and creates diamonds. But humans can't dig all the way down there. They mine them by detecting where a deep volcanic eruption happened that expelled these diamonds to the surface. These eruptions occurred millions of years ago when dinosaurs used to rule the earth. They shot out the diamonds that were in the mantle and are now embedded within the cooled down volcanic material. And that's where people mine them. But these special diamonds found in Brazil originated from a much deeper point than usual, which can further help scientists study the depths of the Earth. They can extract these inclusions and analyze them in a lab to tell where exactly these minerals come from. In the lab, scientists study inclusions, each just 15 to 40 microns wide, less than a quarter width of a human hair. They found out that they contained many types of minerals found in volcanic rock on the surface. The carbon composition of the magma from the surface is much different than the ones deep in the Earth. What's crazy is that these diamonds with special inclusions can only be found 435 miles in the lower mantle. With only a few samples of them found, we don't know what else lies beneath us. It's possible that those mountain ranges underground, taller than Mount Everest, can have traces of diamonds all around, which would prompt excavators to dig them up and saturate the market with them. These diamonds are less flawed than the usual ones and might even come in many sizes. It's possible to see diamonds as large as a car or as small as a grain of rice. There might even be new diamonds with different chemical compositions than the ones we find near the surface. The largest diamond in the world is the Cullinan, which can fit in the palm of your hand. It weighs around 1.3 pounds and is 3,100 carats. It was found in 1905 in South Africa. For anything to exist on Earth, you need carbon. In a nutshell, the carbon cycle is when plants and algae release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere or dissolved in water through photosynthesis. It's converted into carbohydrates and stored as fat. Later on, carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere through breathing, which the plants benefit from, and the cycle goes on. Scientists claim that there might even be a carbon cycle in Earth's interior. The oceanic crust has a lot of carbon sediment that could mix with the upper and lower mantle layer. But there still isn't enough evidence to support this. The deep diamonds might be the key to popping open that theory. Only time will tell. You decide to try a new coffee brand that has a nice golden packing and proudly says 100% coffee on it. But it tastes nothing like your favorite drink. Don't blame yourself for being the worst barista on the planet. The substance you just purchased might just not be the real thing at all. It's so expensive because of how it's made. Coffee plants can't be hurried to grow. Depending on the type of coffee, it takes a coffee tree about three to five years to start bearing fruit. Coffee farming is a people-powered industry, from planting to processing. Coffee farms are often huge, so you need many workers to plant all those new trees. And it takes about 2,000 hand-picked Arabica coffee cherries to make a single roasted pound of coffee. If you want to get the best out of the variety of options, don't fall for labels saying 100% pure coffee. If it doesn't say 100% Arabica, they must have mixed in cheaper Robusta beans, which can make your coffee taste bitter. Check the roasted on date for freshness, not the best by date. When a brand offers a gazillion artificial flavors, it's a sign they're not confident in their beans quality. A good roaster might have a few unique flavors, but not a whole buffet. In Japan, you'll find wasabi all over the place, but chances are, if you've tried it outside of that country, you've had a fake. True wasabi doesn't come from your regular horseradish plant. It's more like a root vegetable made from the underground stem of the wasabi plant. This stem is grated to make the real wasabi paste. Growing wasabi plants isn't easy as they only like clear running stream beds in Japan's mountain river valleys. That's why the real thing is so pricey. Fake wasabi is usually a mix of regular European horseradish disguised as the real deal. You'll find it in squeezable tubes, little packets, or as a powder you mix with water. These products often contain just a tiny bit of the real stuff, usually 1 to 3%. 
It helps cut costs a lot. If you want to check if you've got real wasabi, check the texture. If it's super smooth and pasty, you're likely dealing with pureed horseradish. But if it's got a gritty feel, like it was freshly grated, it's more likely the real deal. Authentic wasabi is always served fresh because its flavor and zinginess vanish quickly once it's grated. The only Parmesan that you can really call this way gotta come from the Emilia-Romagna region in Italy, especially Parma or a certain part of Lombardy. There are only about 300 certified dairies in that area that can make genuine Parmigiano Reggiano. And they've got to age it for at least a year to get those super important umami flavor crystals going. Some of it ages for up to a hundred months or longer. The authentic Parmesan wheels are marked with a DOP stamp. Denominazione di origine protetta, basically saying it's the real deal from the right place. Italian Parmesan is easy to find in most stores, but there are other options that can be cheaper. That's because American-made Parmesan only needs to be aged for 10 months, and some grated blends can have up to 4% fillers, like rice flour or wood pulp cellulose. The legit Parmigiano-Reggiano cheese only has three ingredients, and one of them is milk from cows raised in the same region. Plus, they've got some strict rules about what those cows can't eat, like fermented grain. Maple syrup fans, this one's for you. Did you know that to produce your favorite pancake topping, artisans have to tap maple trees that can grow more than five stories tall, extract sap, and then boil it down? It's an age-old craft passed down through generations from indigenous peoples to modern-day syrup makers. But many of the bottles with sticky sweet syrup inside have nothing to do with that process. Pancake syrup, or table syrup, is a mix of corn syrup, caramel coloring, and flavoring. If you see these ingredients on the label, it's a telltale sign you aren't dealing with the real maple syrup. The consistency of your purchase is another giveaway. The authentic maple syrup is runny. That's why you can pour it easily. Pancake syrup is thicker and stickier. The price can't always give away a fake in this case. It can be affordable even for the real product. Another item that often gets counterfeited is designer bags. To make sure you're buying the real thing, give that purse a good feel. If it's supposed to be leather, it better feel and smell like it. Counterfeiters often skimp on quality materials. Check out the zippers, buttons, or any metal parts. They should feel solid, not lightweight or cheap. And of course, no chipping allowed. Look closely at the seams. Sloppy or uneven stitching is a big red flag. The inner lining is another giveaway. Feel it and make sure it matches the brand's quality. Pay attention to the brand logo. Authentic ones are all about the details. The same goes for the label inside the bag. Get familiar with how it should look so you can spot any slip-ups. Check the number and placement of pockets. Each model has its own design. If it doesn't match up, something's fishy. Shady dealings with extra virgin olive oil date back to ancient Rome. Back then, tricksters would sell low-quality oil or mixes under the fancy Evo label. Nowadays, most legit extra virgin olive oil comes from Spain, Italy, or Greece. They produce it by squishing ripe olives without heating or chemicals. Good Evu might cost you around 10 bucks for a 17-ounce bottle. Fraudsters have gone undercover amidst real producers, making it tough to spot the fakes. But you have more chances of finding the real thing if you avoid blend or light varieties on the label. Check the Preston date. It should be less than a year old since the oil loses its fruity vibe after a couple of years. If there's a harvest date and details like the producer's name or olive type, it's likely legit. Some high-quality oils note the free fatty acidity FFA, level, which is a good sign. Don't automatically trust fancy packaging or high prices. Even an expensive bottle can be past its use-by date. 
If you like to cook, cinnamon, mint, nutmeg, sage, and other spices must always be in your kitchen cabinet. But you can't be sure you've got the real thing unless you're prepared to pay a hefty price for them. When you break it down by the pound, some of them, like vanilla and saffron, are as pricey as precious metals like silver and gold. And where there's value, there's a dark underbelly of fraud. This multi-billion dollar industry is a playground for tricksters looking to make a quick buck. If you don't want to add something fake to your meals, the best you can do is buy the spices whole and grind them yourself. If possible, try to find a retailer that sells spices in bulk. You'll be able to see them yourself, and you won't miss the aroma of real cinnamon or oregano. If you're planning to buy a designer watch, look closely for any blunders or defects on the watch. Designer watches are usually made with high-quality standards, so things like chipped paint, scratches, or spelling errors are rare. Also, check if the clasp works and if the watch keeps accurate time. Genuine designer watches have precise, clear engraving created by skilled watchmakers. If the lettering looks messy or hard to read, chances are it's a fake. Designer watches are made with valuable metals and intricate parts, so they should feel a bit heavier than they look. If a watch feels surprisingly light, it might be fake. Real luxurious watches have unique serial numbers that should be precisely laser etched, not sloppily printed. Make sure these numbers match the case and warranty numbers. Simply search online or contact.